Estamos online. Bom, boa tarde a todos os que estão online no nosso canal no YouTube. Nós vamos iniciar o primeiro simpósio de Tisanóptera, o primeiro simpósio brasileiro de Tisanóptera. Meu nome é Hélio, eu dou as boas-vindas a todos os que estão presentes nesse momento. Boas-vindas aos brasileiros, bem-vindos a todos os, os hispanohablantes também. Welcome, everybody. Uh, nós vamos iniciar a nossa, a nossa primeira sessão com o Dr. Lawrence Mound, que fará a palestra de abertura. Então, é, somente explicando algumas coisas rapidinho para vocês, o Dr. Lawrence Mound aceitou o nosso convite de pronto, ele está disponível agora para fazer a apresentação. Lá na Austrália são três horas da manhã, então ele, como sempre, é uma pessoa muito solista, está aí presente para fazer a palestra dele. Então, uma coisa que ele nos solicitou é que a palestra dele se inicie logo. Portanto, em vez de a gente fazer as apresentações da comissão organizadora, a gente vai passar a palavra para o Dr. Lawrence Maud fazer a apresentação. Eu preciso fazer somente alguns esclarecimentos. O, as, as sessões do simpósio terão uma duração de uma hora, mas essa uma hora será dividida entre a apresentação do palestrante, até 25 minutos de palestra e depois mais 15 minutos de, de perguntas da audiência. Portanto, se vocês quiserem fazer perguntas, vocês podem usar o chat e ao término da apresentação, nós vamos colocar algumas perguntas para o apresentador responder, neste caso, o doutor Lawrence Maud. Ah, antes que alguém possa perguntar, todos os que estão inscritos receberão certificado após o evento ser encerrado, não haverá a, a lista de frequência, portanto, todos os inscritos serão, serão é, certificados ao final do evento. Nós também, a apresentação de hoje será totalmente em inglês, mas nós, todas as apresentações estarão disponíveis em breve no YouTube, né, para quem quiser assistir depois, e as apresentações em inglês nós vamos tentar colocar legendas. Portanto, quem não entender neste momento a apresentação, poderá acompanhar em um outro momento, todos serão informados quando isso acontecer por e-mail. Eu vou fazer uma apresentação rápida do Dr. Lawrence Mound, então passar a palavra para ele. Então, acho que é, o Dr. Lawrence Mound dispensa muita apresentação, mas como nós temos pessoas que talvez não trabalhem com TRIPS, então eu vou fazer uma apresentação rápida. O Lawrence Mound se formou em 1957 pela Sir John Class College, University of London, com um bacharel em zoologia, com especialidade em biologia marinha. Em 1958, se pós-graduou recebendo o diploma de Economic Entomology pelo Imperial College, London, e, em 1959, o diploma de Tropical Agriculture. Né? Entre os vários cargos que exerceu, figuram um entomologista no Departamento de Pesquisa Agrícola da Nigéria, pesquisador e curador do British Museum of Natural History, e, atualmente, ele é pesquisador honorário, ele se aposentou do British Museum e agora está na CSIRO, responsável por uma das mais importantes coleções de tisanóptera do mundo, e está agora presente para fazer a, a sua apresentação no primeiro simpósio brasileiro de Dizanópolis. Logo após o encerramento da palestra dele, nós abriremos, a, então, o um momento de perguntas para que todos possam enviar suas dúvidas. Vou colocar o Dr. Lawrence Maud na tela. Lawrence, can you hear me? Good morning, yes, I'm here. Yes, so I've just presented you to the audience. Yes, indeed. And now you can start whenever you want. So, okay. Lawrence Maud começará a palestra. Thank you so much again, Lawrence, for your presentation, for uh, accepting our invitation. And you can start whenever you want. Okay. Now, uh, Alice and Lima suggested that I talked um, somewhat historically about how ch the changes that I have seen. I'm referred to as a Thrips taxonomist. I don't know what you know, what, what, what you mean by taxonomist but my interests are in the biological diversity of Thysanoptera. I'm not interested just in describing things, what they look like, although many trips look quite strange if you are only used to Western glass rips. I am interested in what each thrip species does, what it does for a living, what does it feed on, where does it live, 
What are its relationships to other organisms, as a pest or a crop, for example, or as food for a lizard or bird? Because the biology and the behavior of a thrips is related to how it has evolved. The identification, the description, the taxonomy, these things are just the start, the start of our understanding of the biology of thrips species. If you work on a pest thrips, such as cotton or peanuts, you have to look at other plants around the crop because you want to know what the entire thrips population of that species is. If it is coming into your crop from other plants around, so you have to have a holistic approach to pest management. So as a taxonomist, I also take an holistic approach to taxonomy. But of course, many taxonomists have worked differently. Our knowledge of the thrips fauna of Brazil is largely based on the work of two North American uh, taxonomists. Most of the thrips species known from Brazil were described by Hood, a professor at Cornell University for many years, or Dudley Moulton in Department of Agriculture in California. Oh, goodness. Disaster. <laughs> Habit of hitting the wrong button. Of the 600 Thysnoptera species recorded from Brazil, Hood described 350 and Moulton another 50. But Hood spent three weeks in Brazil in 1948 and another six weeks in 1951. A total of two months' work in Brazil. Moulton never visited Brazil. Thus, their species are based only on collected specimens with little or no biological information. Hood and Moulton both worked alone with no students. Hood, as a university professor, never trained any student in thrips studies. Taxonomy for them was something that you did alone. And that was also my experience with many taxonomists at the British Museum. But it seemed to me that this lack of collaboration, lack of collaborative work, is a major weakness in developing our knowledge of biology. Working with virologists, I have to know quite a lot of it about virology, how they work. They have to know something about me and how I work on trips. The collaboration is mutually beneficial in bringing together different ideas. So when I retired to Australia, I asked myself that question. I was interested in finding a better way to carry out biodiversity research. But remember, Australia is about equal in area to Brazil or to the USA. It's just as far from Sydney to Perth across Australia as it is from New York to, uh, to, to San Francisco or of course from where um, Adriana Cavalieri is in southern Brazil to where Ellison Lima is in northern Brazil. These are huge areas. Now, um, Ellison Lima pointed out a couple of days ago that I had discussed this subject 20 years ago in Brazil, in the paper in the Entomological Society Journal. Que se caminho seguia? Is there another way? And in settling into Australia 20, 25 years ago, I tried to find a different approach from the traditional insect taxonomists. Now, this is a, a rough coverage of what I do. I have three main objectives in my studies. Firstly, of course, to try to understand the trips biological diversity across Australia. Imagine that across Brazil and the diversity of ecosystems. Similarly, Australian horticulture and quarantine, that again means traveling widely across the country and con to continue to contribute internationally 
to the knowledge of strips, diversity, and biology, and that also means a lot of collaboration. <clears throat> Only through collaborators could I financially afford to travel around this continent to investigate thrips, biological diversity, and their effect on crops. I needed others, and I needed money with them. Each of my three objectives, um, three approaches, has, has, different, has different approaches. There, there is central field work, traveling widely across the continent to establish the biology and host associations of many thrip species. Notice not just to collect thrips. I will continue to point that out. It was mainly to study different ecosystems. I also have a lot of technical work. I have to prepare my own slides and, and to maintain an extensive national and international collection. And of course, there were the communications, and many of you know how much hard work it is to write papers to publish books and to produce websites. Many hundreds of hours go into that. Field work, field work across Australia and also neighboring countries. Field work is the essential component of biodiversity studies, but it needs to be focused. You don't just go out to collect thrips. You want to know what something, so we concentrated particularly on acacia trees, <clears throat> I've also concentrated on casuarina trees or particular ecosystems, such as dead branches, leaf litter. Grasses has been a major product. And of course, in agriculture, various crops, cotton, tree crops, greenhouse crops. It's not just a matter of looking at all these different trips. It's collecting information about biological diversity they're fascinating, but if you were a traditional taxonomist, you would describe this one as in one genus, and that one over on the right as a different genus. I, to me, the, the important question is, why does this one, instead of having a tube, as any tubuliferan fleotripid would, why does it have a champagne cork there? Why does this one have bull's horns there? Why does this one have such a silly little short tube? And what are these big fingers for? Dactylo thrips, the fingered thrips, extraordinary long fingers and many CT there. This one in life has big wax plates there. What's it all for? A taxonomist could just describe them, but I want to know why they're looking different. And to do that, I cannot do it myself. It has to be done with other people, working with students working with other research workers. <clears throat> so these are acacia thrips. Moulton described this yellow one as a different genus from the one on from the one on the left. But they are in fact females, winged and wingless females of one species of thrips living in a gall on acacia. Now, I suggest that that information, that this is one species, is much more interesting than just describing that as a, as a new genus. And in order to do this, I needed collaborators. And of course, my main collaborator was Bernie Crespi from North America. We focused on the thrips on acacia years, trees. It was great fun to look at all this diversity, but why does this thrips look so different? It was a big research group that Bernie Crespi managed to pull together. We had three people at professorial level. We had four post postdocs working on the project. We had three PhD students. So we had a lot of money. Crespi even managed to get a grant from the US forces. One, now why? The driving force behind this project was not taxonomy. It wasn't just ecology. It wasn't just behavior. It was a specific behavior of altru altruism. And that is how we managed to get a, 
a research grant even from the US Army. Because altruism covers things like how many soldiers can you have killed and still win a war? Terribly basic questions in human biology. And so we money came because we were focused on a biological behavioral uh, phenomenon, not because we were looking at taxonomy or ecology. It was not just describing the species diversity. Because these threats, the first six eggs laid by that female Gaul foundress develop eventually into wingless soldiers. Female, the brown female, she lays a few eggs, about six, they hatch, the larvae develop, they pupate, and the adults emerge as these wingless soldiers. And the wingless soldiers do not breed. The foundress goes on to lay many more eggs, and these develop into winged adults of both sexes looking like her. The soldiers defend the gall for the benefit of their winged brothers and sisters. They, the soldiers do not breed. This social behavior involves altruism, and altruism was the driving force behind this research project. The wingless forms surrender their ability, their right to reproduce in order to defend their brothers and sisters. The soldiers defend the Gaul against specialized invasive kleptoparasitic groups. That's the there are two different species there of kleptoparasitic groups. They, by kleptoparasites, they're not predators. They come into a gall, they kill the gall thrips, and they take over their phytophagus. They feed on the gall, not on the, on the thrips. So they take over, they want the house. They drive out the, the gawler and take over. But these interesting uh, ob field observations, this fascinating biology, and there were many other studies, this must be supported by much technical work. And that's where I came in because in CSIRO, when I started, we had 300 microscope slides of strips in the collection. We now have 40,000, representing about 1,000 identified Australian thrip species, plus 5,000 slides of thrips from around the world. The, this was a lot of work making those slides, I assure you. And I have to have a special way of keeping them because this is a library and I have to be able to get information out of it easy. So you see there are lots of labels up there, distribution species labels, genus labels, even host plant labels. And this diversity has greatly expanded our knowledge of the biodiversity of thrips in Australia. Again, I emphasize this is not just my work. I've enabled many people to contribute to this development. From developing our understanding on the ecology evolutionary relationships. Now let's just look at some of the things that I've done over the last number of years. Mostly in collaboration with other biologists, not by myself. Cambys Mine is possibly on, online this morning pointed out just recently that it's in the last 10 years I've published with 90 different people. I was quite astonished by that figure. But there's an, an interesting graph there. I was born that year there, 1934. That's the year, more or less, I went to the British Museum, and that's the year I left. And since then, that's the increase in number of described Cycinoptera species we know from Australia. And I emphasize not just described, but we know the biology of most of them. That communication involved collaboration, whether on identification guides, various identification guides we've produced both in book forms or in, um, or in electronic forms on screen, studies of evolution, studies uh, involving molecular methods, ecological studies and behavioral studies, using a team of people, using many different people. 
and all involving collaboration, unlike Hood or Moulton. The communications with electronic systems has been a major contribution. All these different systems have been published. Even one I've helped with in Brazil. And of course, Thrips Wiki, the information system. Now, each of these, I need, a I need a screen designer. I need to discuss how information to be presented. It's not just taxonomy. I need designers of, with some sort of wit. Notice my designer even managed to put a thrips onto Britannia's shield. And you can even identify what the thrips is. It's Aeolus thrips albicinctus. It involves getting translations done. This, this one was in Mandarin in China. And that one, I imagine that some of you can understand the language of that screen there. And of course, Thrips Wiki, a system that provides an access point to information <clears throat> of Cytonoptera all over the world. And we're back to that word. Dudley Moulton described <laughs> that species of thrips from Australia. He described it as clearly predatory. Now he claims that was a predator. But imagine if you are holding your prey there, your mouth is way back here, it's going to be a bit difficult to feed. What actually does that thing do? Well, it figures on the front of it, the book there. <coughs> and Again, it took a lot of collaboration, a lot of, took a lot of work. This species holds two leaves together, pulls two leaves together, and holding them together, it then produces a glue from its anus. It produces a glue, and it glues two leaves together. And having glued those two leaves together, it creates a nest, and within that nest, like a nest of a mouse or a nest of a bird, it breeds and it raises its family, and the thrips all feed on the leaves of the acacia. This surely is much more exciting than just describing something. Any museum-based taxonomist, any sensible taxonomist, faced with that organism and that organism would say, Oh, goodness, aren't they different? They must be different genera, possibly even different families. But the collaborative work, and that is a lot of, this one is from way out across the other side of Australia, um, four hours by aeroplane from here. They come from the same gall. This is like an aphid. Most of the population is wingless. And you'll find a very large number, hundreds of wingless adults. Males and females look very similar to each other. But the winged form looks very, very different. Now, winged and wingless females from one casuarina gall. Again, this is all work that was carried out some years ago with Bernie Crespi. <clears throat> I look at all these different thrips that can be found and wonder, what does each one do for a living? We know what this one does now. We have a very good idea of what that one does. But I have no idea what that claw is. I do know what it does, the, what these, those two species do. They both of them, like this one in the middle, they both of them build nests. They create nests by gluing together, or sewing together, some, to, some of the species produce silk and sew together leaves and create a nest. But what is this thing? Why does it have these silly, short, fat seti? There are many things we do not know about thrips, also in Brazil. But this one in Australia, we do know. Its behavior is very probably similar to the behavior of this one with these spines at the back end. We know this, we've watched it often enough. It goes into the, it 
goes into the nests of, oh dear. Sorry, I get lost with from current slide. Yes, there we are. It goes into the nests of species that, like this. And it's not a predator. It's a kleptoparasite. It uses the tail like a porcupine does and makes life very, very uncomfortable and difficult. The tail wags backwards and forwards and it whips the bore the nest owner out. It can't fight, it's got no front claws, it uses the tail as a weapon. This one, we've no idea. They are both females, and in that one sample, that one nest, the, there are a continuous variation from a giant female through to a small female. They're both adults, both adult females, and they're living in the same nest, and there are intermediates in size between them. Why does this species have giant females? Why so variable? We've no idea. This one here on the left has very, very long stylets. You see that in a coil in the, head, in the head there. Those stylets are as long as the body. They're huge, long things. Most thrips, the stylets are just short things here. We now know why that has those. But there are plenty of other things we do not know. What about Brazil? Hood described that species many years ago. It's a bit aberrant in its structure. It looks odd. But it wasn't until Adriana Cavalieri started some serious studies that we began to realize just how interesting it is. An ectoparasite attacking. So it's not just Australia where you get wonderful thrips doing wonderful things. There's plenty to look at in Brazil. That one is lives in rainforest. <clears throat> the only large sample I've ever had came from the high in rainforest by using insecticide fogging to drive insects out from the tops of trees and collect them falling to the ground. Why has it got those silly great swollen forewings? Must be impossible to fly with. So what are they useful for? Well, I have an idea, but we won't go into that this morning. Why do so many Panchetotropines have this extraordinary sculpture. That's an SEM picture, so you don't usually see it quite like that. What's the function of that? Moreover, it costs energy to produce for a thrips to grow that. Why does it have? We keep coming back to questions about why the things look like it. Now, there are many interesting thrips in Brazil. This is one of my favorites, though we worked on this in Costa Rica. During the day, you will find the adults wandering out. They're, they lay down pheromone trails on the bark of a tree, and they follow the pheromone trail because they feed on the fungal spores of lichen, of a particular lichen. But at night, they all go home, and they go home to bed in a little groove in the tree. So you see them go out in the morning foraging and feeding, and then at night they go home to bed. Or more than that, you see them take their larvae out. They herd their larvae like cattle. The adults drive, right, walk around on the outside of the colony of larvae, driving it along like gacheros, driving cattle forward. And then again, similarly, at night, they drive, the, they drive the larvae back and put them to bed in a groove in the tree. Fascinating biologists. There are lots of things out there uh, to discover. So another, another big project, we worked on altruism. We used altruism as the driving force to raise funding. There are other aspects of thrips biology that can be used. In my experience is there's very little possibility of raising funding simply because thrips are pests. 
there is some funding to work uh, on thrips as virus vectors, but not many people are really working on the biology of thrips and, and their interactions with viruses. There is interesting studies on pollination. We have another project possibly managing to raise money to work on thrips biology as pollinators of different plants, particularly because in many countries of the world, the honeybee is becoming uh, more difficult due to various diseases. Another biological interaction, of course, is galls. Now, Maria Linda in Brazil has produced a brilliant study on the taxonomy of gall, particular genus of galls in Brazil. But we don't know anything about the galls. We don't know how thrips induce the galls. We don't know if one female induces them or are they communally induced. We don't know if the galls are invaded by predators, by kleptoparasites. We don't know if there's any defensive reaction. We don't know anything about the behavior of the gall thrips or the chemicals that might be involved. There's lots of biological stories there. And these are not getting done. Activities like describing thrips, taxonomy, or even controlling thrips and killing pests, these are obviously useful activities. But I suggest that as biologists, our, our objectives should be broader. They should be broader, not just because it's more interesting to us, but it's more interesting to society at large. And unless you make your studies interesting to society at large, you don't get funding. As a generalization, I would suggest that we need to seek a broader understanding of thrips, structural and biological diversity. We need to know more about how thrips lives, how various thrips, the differences between different species, in order to gain a much broader understanding of how this order of insects has diversified and how their populations are maintained. I think that's probably enough for me. Thank you for listening. And I hope you found some of that story of interest to you. Good morning. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for a brilliant presentation. <laughs> really very interesting. I think that many people do, do not know uh, that TRIPS biodiversity and TRIPS biology is so diverse. So you brought us so many, so much important information about that. It's more important. It's fun, Alison. It's fun. <laughs> um, okay, so we now will be open to, to questions for you. Uh, we will speak in Portuguese asking for questions for you, okay? Surely, if you wish. Uh -huh. Pessoal, então, o Dr. Mound acabou de encerrar a apresentação dele. Nós temos algumas perguntas aqui. É, que foram enviadas pelo chat. É, vamos fazer alguns comentários. Né? Temos, vamos colocar aqui uma pergunta. Então, Silvestre Moreira da Silva, o doutor Maundi comentou alguma coisa sobre a importância econômica. Ele fala, em termos econômicos, qual o valor do prejuízo causado por tisanóptero no Brasil e no mundo? So, Lawrence... Uh, as we have a lot of people in the audience that works on economic entomology, some questions will be related to that. Yes, indeed. And Silvestre Moreira da Silva is asking, in terms, in economic terms, what's the value of the the, the losses caused by Tyson Opter in Brazil and in the world? You can give us some hint on that. Oh, they're not figures that I keep in my mind. Um, <coughs> The, the serious losses are usually in greenhouses because mm -hmm. increasingly we rely on our vegetable crops coming in greenhouses. The, the values in the Netherlands are obviously uh, very, very serious and there are great efforts not to use insecticides if at all possible in greenhouses because you don't want insecticides on your vegetables. But mm -hmm. in in many countries, particularly in the tropics, um, 
there are people who flood insecticides on on their crops um, sure. without picking on particular countries. But as my colleagues in China would say, um, they use a fantastic amount of insecticide because it's easy. Mm. Nobody wants to study the value. You ask about the value and the losses. No one wants to do those studies um, because biology is hard work. This is a this is one of the big difficulties in modern biology. Students do not really want to do field work. It is easier to use insecticides, and of course, it is easier to do laboratory work on molecules than it is to go out into the field and find out how a strips lives. I'm not answering your question directly. It is up to you to find out what the losses are of particular crops in Brazil. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Então, acho que todos devem ter ouvido o Dr. Mauro falando é, sobre as perdas nas casas de vegetação, né? E o uso indiscriminado de inseticidas. Vou colocar aqui alguns, alguma outra pergunta. Is there any natural product that can uh, be used against Tizanoptera? I think that's an, another question for economic entomology. Maybe we can leave it later. We have a lot of comments on you, on your presentation also, Lawrence. I, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see. So Cambis Minet say, I think trip to study around Good the morning, world. Cambis. <laughs> yes. Manfred Litska is also online. Thanks, Lawrence. Hi, Manfred. <laughs> Mariana. Ah, good so we, have, we have a lot of people here. Estevão, yes, indeed. We have a question from Estevão. I think you know him. Yes, indeed. That's in English, so I think. <laughs> what does it take to be a good Tizenopterologist? What do you recommend to fresh, to fresh students? <laughs> well, you have you have some of the best Tizenopterists in Brazil already. Some of the best Tizenopterists in the world. We have two of them. Two of them are organizing these meetings. And I have already mentioned one, and we've just seen her photograph, um, Mariana Linda. Essentially, I keep coming back to it. laboratory studies are not sufficient. Taxonomists tend to work in museums, but the best taxonomists work in the field. The best taxonomists in museums in North America are not the ones that sit um, in their in their laboratories, they're the people that come out and wander across the the rest of the world. But as I've kept on saying, collaboration is the big problem. You cannot do it by yourself. You have got to work with others. And curiously, many taxonomists have rejected that. I've had taxonomists write to me and saying that they work for science. They don't work for other people. Now, that's a, that is, to my mind, a real worry, because we need to make our work relevant to how other people think. The question, the first question came from an economic entomologist. I have to think, how can I make my work on thrips relevant, some of my work relevant to economic entomologists? And I've managed to do so. Mm -hmm. That is what makes a good thysanopterist. <laughs> so collaboration is the key word. Collaboration and field work. Uh -huh. And like any good scientist, keeping an open mind, mm -hmm. being open to new ideas. Ok, então colaboração, trabalho de campo e se manter aberto a novas ideias. Temos uma outra pergunta aqui, Bruno De Marchi. Congratulations on the amazing talk, Dr. Mound. I'd like to know how molecular studies on thrips are aligned with biology studies? Well, I have two or three times put up the front cover of a book that we wrote on acacia thrips, ecology and behavior. The, that was underwritten with a great deal of molecular work. Um, there has been other work on 
uh, that I have been involved with. Unfortunately, m m when people talk of molecular studies on THRIPS, most people are talking about the use of CO1 gene. CO1 gene is very useful for identifying pest species. CO1 gene is of no use for studying um, evolutionary studies, although some people try to do so and actually produce uh, cladograms um, using based on CO1. That's simply gene trees, of course. So yes, there is a great deal of value in molecular studies, but very few people are doing serious studies. There is one, um, I will, tomorrow morning at about soon after this, I will be involved with a student in Indiana, in North America, who is doing some very sophisticated molecular work um, on, on THRIPS. But there are very few people across the world who are doing serious molecular studies. Yes. Okay, we have more questions here, just perhaps one more. What do you think <coughs> is the next bit? Yes, Guilherme. What do you think is the next big step on TRIPS biodiversity research? Find out what lives in Brazil. <laughs> it is, I, know, I know both from, from Elison Lima and from Adriana Cavalieri. Um, working separately, unfortunately, they cannot, they're far apart. They haven't got funding to work together. But, they, but how do you travel widely across Brazil? We have studies in Australia, extraordinary diversity in the desert areas. Now you have got big desert areas in, in Brazil. You have got those big areas in um, Northern Brazil, not far from where Alison Dima works. Yeah. What is the diversity in those? It's hard work and expensive work to get out of them. The next big step is exploration. Yes. Yes. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> uh, okay, Lauren. So I think we have a lot of more questions. Uh, uh, I'm sure you'll be open to receive questions from the audience, as you always do. So uh, eu vou falar ao português. Então, gente, nós estamos encerrando aqui a, a sessão. Temos vários comentários aqui. Agradecemos a todos os que estão presentes. Uh, E aí, daqui a pouco, a gente volta para mais uma sessão. Thank you so much, Lawrence, again, for a brilliant presentation. And you are I'm welcome. Glad you, Go on. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Lawrence. Okay. Enjoy, the rest, of your, enjoy the rest of your meetings. Thank you. Então, gente... Deixa eu... Então, gente, nós vamos fazer uma breve pausa, como, como a gente falou no início, é, nós teremos essas sessões com mais ou menos 25 minutos de, de, de palestra e, então, mais ou menos 15 minutos de questões. Para que todos possam sair um pouco, né, ficar na frente do computador por muito tempo pode ser cansativo, então a gente volta daqui a alguns minutos. <música>